Okay, so it is now 6.30. Thank you all for joining us for tonight's Zoom webinar, The Great North American Eclipse. Um, my name is Christina, and I run the programs here at Bloomingdale Library. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I just wanted to go over a couple of announcements. So we have some events happening at the library, both in person and online this month including tomorrow night, we're gonna have an in-person event. It's about Paul Simon, his solo years, the years after uh, Simon and Garfunkel. So he's been writing music, beautiful music for over 50 years. And we're gonna to listen to some of that. Um, so we're gonna have Gary Wenstrup with us. He is a college professor, popular music expert, and he brings in the most amazing sound clips and video clips of all these different musicians. So he's gonna focus on Paul Simon, the solo years tomorrow night at seven o'clock in person. And then next week, um, we're going to have two Zoom webinars. One is uh, Life on the Appalachian Trail. So we have outdoorsman John Lynn with us, and he's going to take us on a trip, his trip, where he hiked all 2,100 miles of the Appalachians from Georgia to Maine. And his pictures and stories are always really fun. Um, so that's a Zoom webinar on Monday, September 25th at 630 and then if you uh, happen to get your almanac and you saw Autumn in the Smoky Mountains, it was in person, but my presenter had to switch to Zoom. So you can join us on Zoom for Autumn in the Smoky Mountains on Tuesday, September 26th. And that one's going to start at 7 o'clock. So this is uh, retired librarian Nancy McCauley. Um, she loves traveling and she's taking us through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So we're gonna see a lot of images of that and learn a bit about traveling if we are interested in traveling that, um, especially to see the autumn leaves, which I think would be amazing. And if you wanted to join us at the library in person for a drop-in movie on Wednesday, September 27, we're going to watch The Fablemans, which is by, um, oh gosh, now I just lost his name. Hey, Sid, help me out. <laughs> Spielberg. <laughs> Spielberg. Yay, there he is. I knew I, knew I could count on you, Sid. Thank you. So it's about Spielberg's life. So uh, The Fablemans, Wednesday, September 27 at one o'clock. If you want to join us, we're going to have popcorn and refreshments like we always do. All right. And then um, we're going to get started with tonight's program about the great North American eclipse. Um, Michelle Nichols, our favorite astro educator, is going to let us know about this partial eclipse that's coming up pretty soon and one that's coming up a little later. Um, and if you're enjoying tonight's program and you want to come back for more, um, Michelle is going to be with us on October 23rd to talk about the 12 things that make life on earth possible. And then we have her booked in January 2024 to talk about constellations. I'm really interested in that one. And May 2024, she's going to talk about Artemis, which I'm really excited about as well. All right, so let's kick it off. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Christina. It's really great to be back with everyone. And I see a special hello to Sid. He always comes to my program. So hi, Sid. Um, and everyone else who comes as well. I know you're out there. Um, I can't see or hear you, but I know you're there. And uh, it's it's wonderful that you decided to take time out of your very busy schedules to hang out for a little bit and talk about eclipses. So uh, if this is your first time uh, joining me for one of my programs. Uh, I am delighted to always try to keep topics uh, current. Well, there's nothing more current than two solar eclipses coming up. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit later about exactly when to expect them, what to expect. Um, and, and we'll talk about those programs um, We'll talk about those programs uh, coming up or those uh, eclipses coming up and some of the details so you know exactly when to go outside, how to view them safely. But if you know me, you know that I try to I try to put in a little little twist sometimes to some of my topics. And whenever I can talk about history, I love history. Um, I didn't major in it, but I love 
researching it or I love uh, looking up things related to it. So I'm going to talk uh, at first about some history topics. So we're going to uh, just see how far we've come. When did we really start being able to predict eclipses? Um, uh, when was the first photograph of an eclipse taken? It might be a little earlier than you thought. <laughs> so, um, oh, I'm seeing some uh, information in the chat. Some definitely some uh, some friendly some friendly and and known names I'm seeing there. So, all right, why don't we get started? So I'm going to share my screen, and this is being recorded. So if there's information that you don't catch during the program, uh, definitely refer to the recording. Also, there's a couple of slides that I'm going to show you that you may want to have your phone uh, handy to take a photograph of the screen uh, just to hang on to the information that's there. So uh, a web address, especially. Um, so, yeah, just get your phone near. I mean, unless you're watching this on your phone, but if you're watching this on a laptop, uh, get your phone handy just in case. I'll also try to put the information, the, the link in the chat at, at when we're done. So if you miss it, you can't take a screenshot. No problem. I gotcha. So let's go right to sharing my screen here. And loading. There we go. All right. Well, we're going to go back in time, uh, probably a little farther back <laughs> than you thought. So this is a location in Ireland, and this is one of the largest megalithic or giant stone cemeteries in Ireland. About 5,000 years ago, several dozen people were buried here. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute, she's talking about history. Okay, she's talking about eclipses. Okay, what in the world does that have to do <laughs> with people buried in a cemetery in Ireland over 5,000 years ago? Well, there's a good reason. So at this location, um, the, the big mound that you see right in this picture on the right-hand side, that is uh, what's called a cairn, C-A-I-R-N. And it's a, it's a stone burial location, in this case, a pretty big one. Well, there are also other things at this location. Many of the stones in this uh, location, in this cemetery, have stone they have carvings on them. Now, there is an interpretation that the carving that I'm showing you right here depicts a near total solar eclipse that occurred in this location in Ireland on November 30th of the year 3340 BC. And I know for a fact, you're sitting back going, wait a minute, how do you know it wasn't just someone doodling on a rock? Well, to be honest, we don't know if it just wasn't something do somebody doodling on a rock. Could this interpretation be something other than a solar eclipse? Absolutely. Um, but bear with me. Let's see what this could be if it relates to a solar eclipse. You've got, I think you can see my, my cursor. You've got these two sets of uh, uh, stone circles, the carved circles, uh, and one of them is bigger than the other one. The interpretation as it relates to a solar eclipse is that you've got one of these circles going in front of the other circle. So this, this one going in front of the other one, the one on the right passing in front of the one on the left. Could that mean it's the moon going in front of the sun? It could. Um, so there was a near total solar eclipse in this par uh, part of Ireland, November 30th of the year 3340 BC. If you had been in this location, the sky would have gotten dark enough, um, or at least near this location, the sky would have gotten dark enough to see some bright objects in the sky. Now, would the sky have looked exactly like this? No, there would not have been this many stars visible. But you might have seen some of these brighter objects. Saturn would have been visible uh, far to the left um, of, of facing the sun, which would have been to the southwest, so a little bit more toward the south. Mercury and Mars would have been visible a little bit more to the south, uh, or a little bit less to the south. Of, uh, of where the sun was and, and maybe a couple bright stars in the sky. Hmm. So what does that have to do with the stone carving? What are we looking at? Well, if it's the moon going in front of the sun, maybe some of these other dots with circles around them 
might indicate some of the bright objects that may have been visible in the sky on that date during that eclipse. Now, it is impossible to know for sure if this interpretation is correct, because these people didn't leave written records of what exactly this is. It's at least an intriguing interpretation, um, because it's uh, it does have... It, it does have the possibility of being true, but there's there's really no way for us to know for sure. Um, the idea of trying to interpret this gets a little harder, especially because during an eclipse, the moon is in front of the sun for a short period of time, and the sky is dark enough to see something for a very short period of time. People would have been absolutely terrified by what they would have seen because they would have had no idea that the eclipse was going to occur until it actually occurs. So all of a sudden you're do you're going about your day, you might start to notice the the lighting around you looks a little strange and all of a sudden you realize the sky is going dark above you. People would have been freaked out. After the fact, after this eclipse was over, maybe then they sat back and went, "Oh, what did you see? Oh, what did you see? Someone decided, I'm going to record this momentous event on this rock right here. They probably didn't get the exact location of everything correct, because if you only see this for a few minutes at most, you may not remember what's where. And so ex uh, depicting it exactly is not really the point of what they wanted to do. They wanted to go, hey, this amazing thing happened and we were terrified. And look, I'm going to try to depict it in some way on this rock right here. If this is true, if if this could actually be a drawing of a solar eclipse on a rock from over 5,000 years ago, this is the earliest drawing, the earliest depiction anywhere of a solar eclipse. Pretty fascinating, if true. Now, the earliest written mention of an eclipse is in a Chinese document. The <laughs> I love the quote related to this document. The quote that is in this document describes a solar eclipse in the most understated way ever. It says, on the first day of the last month of autumn, the sun and moon did not meet harmoniously. Hmm. So you go, oh, that is probably the 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 least uh, least amount of excitement used to describe a solar eclipse. Uh, another document, another written record about this time states very simply, the sun has been eaten. Um, this is thought to be the solar eclipse of October 22nd of the year 2137 BC. Now there is a long standing tale about this eclipse, which often gets trotted out about the time of a, of a big solar eclipse and people get all excited and they go, hey, look, we're gonna write about these stories that people used to tell about solar eclipses. And so let's pick out this one. And it's about the Royal Astrologers, Hay and Ho. In one version of the story, they were drunk and didn't warn the emperor about the eclipse ahead of time. So October 22nd of 2137 BC, all of a sudden the sky goes dark, the emperor's scared. Um, and supposedly they paid for this mistake of not warning him with their lives. Now, whether they knew that the eclipse was coming or not is highly debatable, and I would firmly put that in the in the category of no chance. Nobody was able to predict solar eclipses more than 4,000 years ago. Um, this is probably a highly apocryphal tale. Eclipses at this time were thought to be caused by a dragon devouring the sun. Early words for eclipses in China meant to eat or to devour. And the moment the sun was totally eclipsed, people would do all sorts of things to get the sun to return. They would light fires or shoot arrows at the sun to try to make it catch fire again. And others might bang pots and pans to scare the dragon away. And since the sun always returned after they made all this ruckus, it is easy to see. I mean, it, this always worked. So you absolutely would go out every single time there was a solar eclipse and do all this, do all the right things to be able to make the sun reappear. Well, this 
go forward another uh, couple thousand years. So this is a, a Babylonian solar eclipse tablet listing eclipses between the years 518 and 465 BC. The Babylonian astronomers carefully noted when lunar eclipses and solar eclipses occurred. At first, they were just noticing when they happened and wrote them down. When they started analyzing the patterns of what they were writing down, the astronomers there were able to predict lunar eclipses first. Um, you don't need quite as much mathematical accuracy to predict a lunar eclipse as you do a solar eclipse. So predicting lunar eclipses was an easier thing to do. Uh, so they were able to predict the lunar eclipses first, then later solar eclipses with a fair amount of accuracy. And as time went on, they got a little bit better, a little bit better. Eclipses were often up until actually up until maybe even uh, the early part of the 20th century, depending on who was looking up at the sky, um, people thought of them as bad omens or the end of the world or or all these bad things were happening. So it's not surprising that uh, it, this isn't this isn't a long ago thing, a thousands of years ago thing that people thought solar eclipses were scary. There are stories in in U.S. newspapers from a uh, solar eclipse uh, less than 100 years ago that caused people to think the world was actually coming to an end. So this is not a long ago thing. But we are gonna go forward um, uh, a little bit farther in time. And this map that you see right here is from just before 1715. Yeah, I just jumped forward about 2000 years, bear with me. Um, this one, this eclipse is known as Halley's Eclipse, and that is named for an astronomer you've probably heard of, Edmund Halley, and I don't know if you can see it. If you're on a big enough screen, you might notice his name here on the bottom right part of this map. Um, this is called the Broadside. Basically, what a broadside was, was kind of a newspaper of the day, sort of. It was a one-sheet uh, bit of news that might have been tacked up on a wall, so anyone wandering by could take a look and see what whoever was writing about what they had to say. Edmund Halley predicted this eclipse, May 3rd, 1715. He predicted it ahead of time, he knew it was going to happen, and had a fair amount of, of uh, accurate prediction that the totality part of the eclipse, when the moon 100% covered the sun, that that was going to fall over part of England. And you can see this, this shadow area right here. Um, he was one of the first, if not the first, to depict uh, a path of totality, not just predict where the eclipse was going to occur, predict where you needed to be on a map to be able to see the moon 100% cover the sun. And so that's what this is showing you right here. It's showing you the shape of the moon's shadow on the earth. And it's showing you the path where if you're there at the right time, you'll see the moon 100% cover the sun. If you're outside this path, you still see an eclipse, but the moon is only partly covering the sun. The closer you are to the path, the more of the sun is covered. The farther you are from the path, the less of the sun is covered. What's kind of amazing is he got people excited about this eclipse. It wasn't just predict it, tell people about it, get everybody excited about seeing it. And then he gathered information from people. Did you see the eclipse? If so, what time did you see it? Gathered that information up to see how accurate was his map. Now I can show you how accurate his map was. But if you take a look right here, this is the mouth of the Thames River. And so he was able to make a later version of this map that showed the uh, that particular eclipse. And then the next one that was going to be visible in this area, um, this map was published in 1723, and it has the corrected path. So here's the mouth of the Thames River. His original map had the path of totality a little bit too far to the northwest. He he slid it a little bit to the a little bit farther to the southeast to reflect where the eclipse was actually visible. And so this next broadside was getting everybody excited about that next eclipse coming up on May 11th of 1724. Again, these maps 
depicting it like this, we see this all the time. And so this is um, really neat to think that these types of maps where we can go, hmm, am I in the right place to see totality? And then later, could I go see this eclipse? People may probably didn't travel to see this particular eclipse, but they did later on. Now, the total solar eclipse of June 24th of 1778 was the first one to be carefully observed in the newly founded United States. It wasn't the first solar eclipse to occur in the in the uh, in the new U.S., um, but it was the first total solar eclipse. And Thomas Jefferson himself attempted to see it. Note, I said the word attempted. And he wrote, quote, we were much disappointed in Virginia generally on the day of the great eclipse, which proved to be cloudy. We can relate, can't we? <laughs> so um, George Washington doesn't mention the eclipse in any of his writings that survive, but troops in his army took notice as preparations were, were being undertaken for the forthcoming, what would be known as the Battle of Monmouth. Um, and the eclipse occurred during the preparations. A Revolutionary War veteran remembered uh, and wrote later, quote, the day we were drafted, the sun was eclipsed. Had this happened upon such an occasion in olden time, it would have been considered ominous, either of good or bad fortune, but we took no notice of it. Thinking, you took no notice of a total solar eclipse. That's kind of amazing. Um, but the map on the right is showing you uh, where the path of totality was inside these blue lines right here. Um, during the eclipse of October 27th of 1780, in this one, there was an actual science expedition that went to this eclipse. So this one, generally people were, were waiting for it to happen. So if you were living inside this blue bounded path right here, you would have seen the eclipse had it been clear out. Unfortunately for Thomas Jefferson, that didn't work. But in this one, this uh, area of the country where you could see totality was being held by the British at that point. And Professor Samuel Williams of Harvard University decided to lead a science expedition approximately to this location right here. And he got in touch with the British and said, non-combatants here, we're scientists, we want to go over there and see the eclipse. Definitely, I'm paraphrasing. Um, but unfortunately, he had a little bit of an error in his calculations. Again, predicting eclipses is difficult. He narrowly missed seeing totality. He saw it at 99%. 99% is not 100%. So he did not see totality for this eclipse. Well, it just shows you that we're starting to get to the era of travel to go see eclipses. So first, omens, terrible. Then prediction, still omens, terrible. And then prediction and, hey, get ready for it. And isn't that cool? And maybe we're going to start to travel to these eclipses and see them. We'll come back to that. Now, accurate Western sketches of what it looks like during a total solar eclipse started appearing in the 1700s and 1800s. This one is from a publication that details um, the solar eclipse of June 16th of the year 1806. And the sketcher, whose name is on the screen, Jose Joaquin de Ferrer, he gave the feature seen around the sun, so this whitish colored area right here, the name we use today. It is the name Corona. This is the Latin word for crown. We still use that term. Now, people had noted that whitish colored feature around around the, the, the combination of the sun and the moon. They just didn't know what it was. And even in the 1600s, they were saying, hmm, well, could this be part of the moon? And later on, they realized, oh, wait, no, it's part of the sun. We're not sure what it is, but it is part of the sun. Um, and so we still use that Latin word corona today. Now, this is the first successful photograph of a solar eclipse and the corona. Notice that whitish area right around there. And it was made probably earlier than you think, July 28th of 1851. It was extraordinarily difficult to do, given the high contrast in the image between the dark moon and the brighter corona. Now, the corona 
in reality is not that bright. It's only about as bright as the full moon in the sky or equivalent to uh, the full moon. You never see it except during a total solar eclipse because the the bright part of the sun washes it out. You, it's it's always there. You just can't see it because the the rest of the sun is just so bright. But when you block out the bright part, you get to see the corona, but that's still bright compared to the dark part of the moon, the shadow side that's facing us. What made this difficult was the amount of time it takes to, to take uh, in enough light in your camera to see anything at all. So you only get a few minutes at most during totality. So it's still pretty amazing that they actually got a successful photograph and got enough light to generate an image. Now, yes, this is the same picture on both sides. Um, this is meant to go in a stereo viewer that you might hold in front of your face or maybe wear on your face. You would put the, the set of images in and the lenses inside would bring the images together and make it look like a stereo or 3D image. Uh, but the lady in the center of the picture is the United States first professional female astronomer. Her name was Mariah Mitchell. She led an eclipse expedition, a scientific expedition, just like Professor Samuel Williams from Harvard University in 1780. But this was an expedition from Vassar College in 1869. This image is from Burlington, Iowa, and it features uh, Mariah and one of her ladies that went along with her in the expedition to, to do the science that they were doing related to this eclipse. You can see a telescope in the background and dignitaries from Burlington, Iowa, arrayed around the two of them. Well, she did this again in 1878, this time to Denver, Colorado, and residents of Denver streamed out of the city, not only to see the eclipse, but to see her group. Now, the this was an all-female scientific expedition. That was as much of a novelty as the eclipse itself. And people were astonished to see women doing science. That was the amazing thing along with this eclipse. And they wrote about it as well. In the newspaper, one of the quotes is, uh, the well, the astronomers in pleated dresses provided, quote, an attraction to the gaping, yet respectfully distant, multitude of masculines, almost as absorbing as the eclipse. Hmm. Professor Mitchell herself, as with iron gray curls fluttering under a broad brimmed leghorn type of hat, she swept the heavens with a four inch telescope or directed with native majesty and grace the operations of her assistant nymphs was a figure and perfectly commanding. OK, let's put aside the fact that that probably should have been three or four individual sentences instead of one long run on people were amazed to see these women doing their thing and again it was as much a novelty to see as as the eclipse was itself but they were amazed by mariah mitchell and thought thought really highly of her as well to come to denver and 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 do their thing actually uh, Thomas Edison was supposed to come to Denver as well, and he decided to go someplace else. And uh, the the residents of Denver were uh, a little put out, but they they were highly complimentary of Mariah Mitchell, not so much of Thomas Edison for basically leaving him in the lurch. So she came to Denver. He didn't. They liked her. They didn't like him. <laughs> so anyway, all right, moving on. Um, the Denver Post in 1918 printed this um, newspaper uh, cover, and I love the I love the headline at the bottom: "Police enforce quiet so astronomers at university may make priceless observations. Movies to be taken, throngs seek vantage points. So if you've traveled to see a solar eclipse, you definitely are among people in the last century or more who have decided to go travel to see one, or maybe you wanted to wait for one to occur." over your heads. You still are among lots of people who are fascinated by solar eclipses. I'm going to take a quick drink of water. Give me just a sec. All right. But I'm going to show a picture that you probably weren't expecting. Some of you I know are going to know who this is. And you're probably wondering why in the world is she showing a picture of Howdy Judy? 
Now, the first television broadcast of a solar eclipse was on March 7th, 1951, and it was part of the Howdy Doody show. And this was also the first color broadcast episode of that show. There were a lot of television innovations that occurred during the Howdy Doody show because of that show. And one of them was showing uh, TV imagery of a solar eclipse. I could not find... I could not find an actual picture, a screenshot of the eclipse itself. That would have been really neat to see. But anyway, suffice it to say, they really did do that during the show. But this was a partial solar eclipse that they showed. Um, the first television broadcast of a total solar eclipse hosted by this gentleman, of course, Walter Cronkite, March 7th of 1970. And this is something we take for granted these days. We expect the latest science happening in the sky, especially a solar eclipse, is going to be broadcast on TV on a dozen different cable channels or on uh, or on the Internet, which brings up a good point. When was the first Internet broadcast of a solar eclipse? And the answer was October 12th, 1996, so a little under 30 years ago. This was a partial eclipse that was visible in the UK and new images were uploaded at the lightning fast speed of every five minutes. <laughs> um, and not everybody got to see it online because you had to have a fast enough computer to handle the imagery that was being uh, broadcast on this website uh, in 19. 96. I did not see this one online in 1996. Um, I was working at the other at that point, but uh, no, did not have uh, a fast enough computer to be able to see it. That would have been pretty neat. All right. So let's get into some science, shall we? Let's let's talk about all the, the what's going on in the next couple eclipses that that people have streamed out of Denver in the 1870s to be able to see. And Edmund Halley got people excited about in 1715. And uh, we've broadcast on TV and the internet and radio and everything to be able to uh, bring the, the magic of one of these sky events, which is really actually pretty accessible. But what I've got up on the screen is just a quick depiction of why these are rare. Please take a look at, you've got the, the moon and you've got the earth. This is to scale. You've got the sun shining on the moon. The moon casts a shadow into space and the shadow uh, heads toward the earth. Well, the moon's orbit around the earth is not a perfect circle. So, or sorry, is not, um, is not flat. The moon's orbit is not flat. It's tilted with respect to the earth's orbit. And so that means the moon's shadow normally misses the earth. It usually passes above the earth or below the earth. But when everything lines up just right, the moon's shadow passes over the earth. If you're in the right location at the right time, you get to see a, a solar eclipse. Either the moon partly covering the sun or the moon totally covering the sun, right? Partial solar eclipse or a total solar eclipse. Just depends on where you are. And look at how teeny tiny this shadow is by the time it actually gets to the earth. This is the dark part of the shadow. This little, you might not even be able to see it. This little tiny area right here is where you would need to be to be seeing the sun 100% covered by the moon. The, the, uh, the width of the shadow on the earth is sometimes well under 100 miles wide. This next eclipse coming up in uh, April, which is a total solar eclipse, that shadow region, that darkest part of the shadow region is, I believe, a little under 130 miles wide, but still, 130 miles wide for an earth that is 8,000 miles wide. You need to be in that really specific location to be able to see a solar eclipse. But also these things are still more rare than that. Why don't we see one of these more often? The same spot on earth will see a total solar eclipse on average, every 375 years. Now, that is not a like clockwork average. That's just a purely average uh, amount of time. But that's still a kind of a large amount of time, right? So these are definitely rare events. But like I said, they're even more rare than you think. And there's a good reason. So the, the Earth's orbit around the sun is not a perfect circle. 
So we are closest to the sun in January. We are farthest from the sun in July. I probably just surprised people by just saying that. So we're closest in January. We're farthest from July. What that means is the size of the sun in the sky, the apparent diameter of the sun in the sky is a little bit different. Um, so it varies by about 3%. And so you'll have to take my word for it, especially if you're on a small screen, that that size difference right there is supposed to depict 3%. And actually that might even be a little bit too much, um, but the, the, uh, the apparent size difference is not enough that you're gonna notice at all, um, but it means the sun's apparent diameter is a little bit bigger in, in the uh, January timeframe and a little bit smaller in the middle of the year timeframe. I'll come back to what that means in just a second. The moon's orbit around the earth is also not a perfect circle. So the it, it's as close as about 220,000 miles, as far as about 252-ish thousand miles. So the close point and the far point difference means that it can be as much as a 14% difference in size. You know, you're not really going to notice that difference in size. It's really kind of small. You may notice a uh, maybe a little difference in brightness or something of the moon, but you're really not going to notice a difference in size unless we're maybe talking about a solar eclipse. So when the moon is a little bit closer to the Earth and the Earth is a little bit farther from the sun, the moon is then big enough to cover the sun completely in the sky. And you get, if you're in the right spot, a total solar eclipse. If the Earth, if the moon is a little bit farther from the Earth and the Earth is a little bit closer to the sun, the sun's a little bigger, the moon's a little smaller, the, the moon is not big enough to cover the sun completely at its greatest extent for the eclipse. And that is the type of eclipse we're going to get in October. We have a special name for that eclipse. It's called an annular solar eclipse. Uh, Again, what that means is the moon is not big enough to cover the sun completely. The moon's a little farther away. It's a little bit smaller in the sky during the time when the eclipse occurs, which is new moon, the phase that we call new moon. And so you are you get an eclipse that looks kind of like this. We are not going to see this uh, type of eclipse. We are going to see the moon partly cover the sun. I'll explain more about that in just a bit. Um, but if you're in the right place on the earth at the right time, you'll get to see this, this ring-shaped solar eclipse. Annular comes from the Latin word annulus, which means ring, referring to the ring of sun left around the moon during the solar eclipse. Now, when we are looking ahead to the eclipse in April. That is a total solar eclipse. And that means the moon's a little closer to the earth. The earth is a little farther from the sun. The moon is big enough to cover the sun completely. And if you're in the right place at the right time, you get to see this. And this is what we call totality. Um, and so I'll show you a map in just a bit that where you're gonna be able to see either the ring-shaped eclipse or totality for this. So Saturday, October 14th, 2023 for the ring-shaped eclipse. Monday, April 8th, 2024 for the total solar eclipse. Again, I'll, I'll show you maps in just a bit. During totality, if you've never seen totality, it's it's a it's an incredible experience. And um, uh, it, the, the sky above you goes dark. You can see bright objects in the sky, like planets or bright stars, if they're if they're visible, if they're uh, in the right part of the sky while the eclipse occurs. It looks like a full moon night. And remember that corona is about as bright as the full moon. So it looks like what the sky looks like during a full moon. If there's a clear view to the horizon, you can, and if you're maybe up slightly higher, you can see the shadow of the moon coming at you. The shadow is traveling at over a thousand miles an hour and you can watch it uh, sweep over you if you've got the right conditions. Um, and so then what you've got around you at the horizon is what we call a 360 degree sunset, <clears throat> excuse me. But when the sun is in is higher up in the sky, the, the edges of the of the view look a little brighter, but because you're looking off into the distance. 
where you're seeing the sky around you a little bit brighter, but it's dark above your head. It's, it's really cool. Now I mentioned we're going to see a partial solar eclipse. So the partial solar eclipse is uh, what's going to be visible for both of them on October 14th and April 8th. Uh, but what a partial solar eclipse is, the moon partly covers the sun. Technically, the annular solar eclipse is also a partial solar eclipse. The moon is only partly covering the sun. It's just, it's got a, a funky ring to it. That's all. That's just, it's just, it, it gets a better brand name. That's all. Um, but it's, it's still a neat eclipse to see. It's just not a total solar eclipse. Now, if you want to see what the moon's shadow on the earth looks like, here's an example. So this is, this was taken during the 2017 solar eclipse with, by astronauts on the International Space Station looking down, uh, looking across and down on the, on the moon's shadow as it was passing over the earth. And here is a closer up image of that. If you were within this shadow region, you saw totality. If you were just at the edges, you saw totality for a much shorter period of time. If you were just on the outside of the darkest part of the shadow, you didn't see totality. You still saw some of the bright part of the sun. And so where you are really does determine what exactly you're going to see. Here is a view from a, a NASA spacecraft. And that was approximately when the shadow was passing over uh, Southern Illinois. Um, but you can see the dark part of the shadow right here. But to show it just a little bit better, here is from a different NASA spacecraft. And it takes a few hours for the shadow to completely fall from one side of the Earth. The Earth is turning. The moon is moving um, for that shadow to pass from one edge of the Earth to the other. Now, this is showing us an animation of what that shadow region is going to do on October 14th, 2023. So the moon shadow is going to intersect the Earth. If you're within this yellow path right here, that's where you're going to see the ring of sun around the moon. If you're outside the path, but still within the, the shadow region, then you'll see the moon partly cover the sun. If you're close to the path, the more of the sun is covered by the moon. If you're closer to the edge of the shadow the and farther away from the path, the less of the sun is covered by the moon. Don't worry about this time up here. I'm going to show you what the time looks like for our specific location. So don't worry about that, that time listed on the upper right-hand part of the screen. Um, but that shadow is moving. And again, so you have to be in the right place at the right time to see the ring of sun eclipse. If you're outside the shadow region, you won't see the eclipse. Notice the southern part of South America is not going to be within the shadow region. They're not going to see the solar eclipse, even though it might be sunny that day. They won't see it. They'll be outside the moon shadow. It's that small when the shadow hits the Earth. April 8th, 2024. Same type of animation, but um, so the uh, shadow is going to sweep up from the southwest and if you're within this shadow region, you're going to see the moon 100% cover the sun for a short period of time. In this case, uh, a little over four minutes at its greatest extent. Southern Illinois is going to see a maximum of four minutes and 10 seconds of the moon 100% covering the sun. If it's clear out, remember, this is April. We don't know if it's actually going to be clear out. It may not be. We may be in the same boat as Thomas Jefferson. Um, it may be cloudy. Who knows? Um, but hey, that's what you have to do. You, you got you to gotta take what the sky gives you. And if the sky gives you clouds, that's what you get. Um, again, I'll, sh I'll go over uh, in information for our area in just a second. Um, and what will Illinois see? Illinois, uh, for October 14th is going to see a maximum of about 43% uh, here in Northern Illinois of the sun covered by the moon down in Southern Illinois, a maximum of about 55%. And Monday, April 8th, 2024 in Chicago, 94% of the sun is covered by the moon. The closer you are to this path of totality, the more of the moon is, co is covering the sun until the path of totality. If you're within this region down here in Southern Illinois, you'll see the moon 100% cover the sun. And the closer you are to the middle of this path, the longer the eclipse is. A maximum of four minutes, 10 seconds near the middle and just a few seconds at most at the edges of the path. All right, so what are we going to see here? 
Okay, so I've got times specific for Aurora, Illinois in the bottom here. That's where I am. So, but don't worry. The times are specific for the entire Chicagoland area, close enough. Um, so at 1037 in the morning on Saturday, October 14th, the moon is going to just barely start peeking over the edge of the sun. And it's going to start sliding over the sun until it, the maximum hits at about 1158 a.m. So that's the time when you get the maximum eclipse, uh, approximately what you see here in this depiction. The moon continues to slide. It moves slowly until 1.22 p.m., which is when the eclipse ends. So 10.37 to 1.22 on Saturday, October 14th, 2023, with a maximum at 11.58 a.m. Now, those times are good for the Chicago area. If you're going someplace completely different, then you'll have to look up the times for that specific location. Um, where you are will determine the times that you're going to see the eclipse. Because if you're out to the to the western United States, the time zone will play a part also, um, or to the eastern U.S. So definitely look look it up. If you're not going to be in the Chicago area for this eclipse, uh, definitely look up the times for where you're going to be. I will have the link to a map um, at at the end of this talk. So I'll put that in the chat when we're done. So here is the path. So this is the path you need to be in to be able to see the ring of sun portion of the eclipse. So it's going to go through the four corners area. The The closer you are to the middle of the path, the more centered the moon is in that ring. The closer you are to the edges of the path, the more the moon is off to one side of the sun. And then outside the path, you don't see the ring at all. You see the moon cover the sun partly. And the farther you are from the path, the less of the sun is covered by the moon. All right. Monday, April 8th, what are we going to see? Even a little bit more dramatic. So at 1250 p.m., again, times are good for the Chicagoland area. Uh, 1250, the moon just starts to peek over the edge of the sun, continues to slide until... A little bit after 2 p.m., the moon covers the sun at 94%. That's more than we had in 2017. You may actually start to notice the sky around you, the, the, the light level might look a little odd. You might notice shadows looking very, very sharp. You may notice the light level dimming just a bit, although that part maybe not quite uh, noticeable to your eyes, uh, just because your eyes are always adjusting to the, the changes in light level. So you may not notice that. Um, but the uh, moon will continue to slide over the face of the sun. So this is a gradual slide until 3.24 p.m. The eclipse is over. All right. So where do you need to be to see 100% coverage? It is right in here, this red path. Notice it's going to come up through Mexico. Mexico is where they're going to see the longest duration of the eclipse. Again, uh, over four minutes for this one. Austin is going to see it. I think the outskirts of San Antonio. I don't think all of San Antonio is going to see it. Dallas and, and many of the Dallas suburbs are going to see it. Um, we get up here into the uh, northeastern U.S. We've got Toledo. We'll see a, a shorter duration. Cleveland will see close to the close to the maximum. Um, up here through Rochester, they're going to have a big party up there. Um, and the closest large city to for totality would be Indianapolis. Uh, so it's only about three hours. Uh, from Chicago, but please know if you are still on the fence of traveling to go see this eclipse, many of the hotel rooms are already booked up. So if you're deciding to travel, I would recommend just driving to the path of totality if you can, if the weather's good, pull off on the side of the road and drive back home. Just maybe stay off the interstate because you might get stuck in the same traffic jam that people got stuck in in, 20, in 2017, uh, where it took 14 hours to get from Carbondale to Chicago <laughs> after that eclipse was over um, as everybody hit I-57 at the same time. And it wasn't just I-57 that experienced this traffic jam. These traffic jams were seen all over the United States because people traveled to totality and then left. And so it was an extraordinary set of traffic jams. 
anyway, um, if you happen to go to totality and it's clear out, um, you might see some bright dots in the sky during totality. Jupiter will be off to the left of the moon and sun combo. Venus will be off to the right and Saturn will be uh, off to the lower right, but not as bright as Venus and Jupiter. So Saturn might be a little bit harder to see than the rest. Okay. So let's say oh, you want to go to, you want to see this eclipse. Maybe you're not necessarily traveling to go see it. Maybe you want to see the partial eclipse in this area, or maybe you are traveling to see it. Oh, uh, but you want to be able to uh, see it, but darn it, you forgot your solar viewing glasses. What do you do? Well, there are indirect ways of seeing imagery of the combo of the moon and sun. And you can do this by what we call pinhole projection. You can take anything around the house with a hole in it. And that would be, uh, in this case, pasta strainer. Every single hole in the pasta strainer becomes an opportunity to project an image of the eclipse down onto the ground. And this is good for the partial eclipse. So get an index card and punch some holes in it with a push pin. Get the pegboard from the garage that's holding up the tools hanging off the hanging off the wall. That stuff, right? Anything with a little hole in it, you may be able to use that to then project an image, hold whatever that is perpendicular to the sun, and then project an image of the eclipse down onto the ground. Um, you don't look through the holes. You're, this is not a way to see the sun directly. You would be putting a focused image of the sun onto your eye. Don't do that. This is to project an image down onto the ground. And you could also, you don't even need any equipment. What you can try is, and I'm going to stop sharing for just a second because I want to be able to show this. So um, you can interlace your fingers like this and the little tiny spaces in between your fingers becomes an opportunity to project an image down onto the ground. So hold your, hold your hands perpendicular to the sun and then use that kind of adjust the spaces in between your fingers and project an image of the eclipses down onto the ground this works so well i was uh giving a training session for some of our staff last week and there was an led light above us that had individual little tiny led bulbs in it and i went like this and boom there were some images of the led bulbs on the table you could see it. It was within a second of me uh, getting my fingers in the right spot. And you could see that. It was pretty cool to see. I was really kind of proud of myself to show people, to show our staff that. Um, all right, let's get back to the slides right here. So, all right, it's loading. And there we go. Okay. In October, you can use the leaves and the bushes on the uh, to be able to use the spaces in between them look down below them because those little spaces in between the leaves become pinhole projectors unless you're traveling farther south you won't be able to do this in april because we don't have leaves on the trees in april so you won't be able to use that method um for pinhole projection using using trees and bushes and stuff um but that's okay. Depending on where you're going, the farther south you go, the more likely it is you'll have leaves on the trees and the bushes by then. You can use anything with a hole in it. In this case, a cracker. I'm going to guess that they might have taken like a little pin or something, kind of cleaned out the holes in the cracker a little bit just to make it a little little bit easier to, to, uh, to be able to project images of the eclipse. You can see little tiny images. This is from 2012. So I love that. So again, anything with a hole, nothing fancy. Index card, push pin, hole, perpendicular to the sun, project a little image of the eclipse down on the ground. That's it. That's all you need. Now, if you do get solar viewing glasses or solar viewers, I'm going to demonstrate how you use them. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing again for just a second. There we go. All right. So... Solar view, solar viewers or solar viewing glasses, they, they both work exactly the same. They're just a different shape. Um, so we I have one of these. Solar glasses are the ones you wear over your face. But again, they all work exactly the same. You've got a reflective side and a darker side of the film. The reflective side faces to the sun. The darker side faces your face. 
Okay, so you put the reflective side facing out, you put it in front of your eyes first, then you put you you look up at the sun, then you look down, then you take it away. You don't look up at the sun first and then put that in front of your face. Don't do that. Um, so very simple to use. And if you've got glasses left over from 2017, as long as you've kept them dry, no punctures, holds, rips, tears, anything like that, then they should be fine. The, the material doesn't expire. If you've got glasses from much prior to that, I would throw those away and get new ones. The farther in advance you buy them, the less expensive they'll be and the more likely they'll be available. However, I know you're going to ask, you're probably thinking, I know you're out there, you're thinking, uh-oh, I remember in 2017, there was that big controversy about counterfeit glasses. And the answer is, yeah, it's the same problem in 2023 and 2024. The counterfeits started appearing on the market last year. So I'm going to show you where you can go to get the list of reputable, safe solar glasses and solar viewers manufacturers. Give me just a second. Um, so we've got the solar viewers and solar glasses you can't easily tell by just looking at them if they're safe. You also, um, oh, I'm not sure if the screen share just shared. Sorry, I need to go back. I'm gonna go redo this because the image of it disappeared. So I'm not sure it actually loaded. Give me a sec. And there we go, okay. So you could potentially uh, look for a certification that's listed, a certification number that's listed on the solar viewer or solar glasses. The problem is that is often counterfeited. Um, you don't just put that on if some group says, oh, yeah, your stuff is legit. Here, you can put your certification on there. Anybody can print that on their stuff. That is not an indication of something being legit or not. And again, you can't just tell by looking at them if they're actually legit. Um, the problem we saw a lot of times in 2017 was the glasses were actually too dark or you couldn't see through anything, see through them at all. So the the problem though is, yeah, it might they might be letting through a, a fair amount of visible light, light that your eyes can see. The problem is what you don't know if it's letting through is ultraviolet light or infrared light from the sun. That light is the light then can that can burn your eye, burn the back of your eye. So you also can't know that the burn is happening until after it occurs because you have no nerve endings in the back of your eye to be able to register pain. So now that you've probably been sufficiently worried can't just go by that certification. So what do we do? Well, I'm sending you, this is where if you have your phone and you can take a shot of the screen, please do. If not, I'll put this into the chat when we're done. Please write down or screenshot this web address, eclipse.aas.org, the website of the American Astronomical Society, the Eclipse website of the American Astronomical Society. In the eye safety section of that website, is a list of reputable, legit solar glasses manufacturers and importers. Some of the stuff is made in the United States. If you're looking for American-made stuff, American Paper Optics and Rainbow Symphony, those are the two main American manufacturers. There are others, but those are the two main ones. Others from outside the country are still legit. Please go to this site, to that eye safety section, get this list and use these links on the site. Don't just write the name down and go to your favorite third party website that happens to be the name of a giant forest in Brazil. Don't go to that because that's where you're going to find the counterfeit glasses. You cannot only counterfeit the certification, they counterfeit the uh, manufacturer's logos and names. Anyone can say, oh, I'm selling Rainbow Symphony glasses when they're not. So you must go use these links directly. The American Astronomical Society has gone through and vetted the legit stuff from the non-legit stuff. All right. So this is the website to go to for sure. And if anybody 
wants to uh, learn where more about these companies, use these links uh, right on the site. And actually, you might see more than just the what's on this screenshot. I screenshotted this several months ago, so they may have added more in the meantime. So there's there's definitely more to choose from. The thing is, the closer we get to both eclipses, the less that's going to be available because they're going to sell out. So the farther in advance you get them, the more likely you are that they'll actually be available. And then finally, I'm going to screen. I'll I'll put these links in the um, in the chat. So don't worry about screenshotting these. They're showing up as blue on your end, and that's not easy to see. So I'll grab this in just a second. But if you want the maps of upcoming eclipses, that's what these links are here. So let me stop sharing, and I'm going to grab these links. Um, let me give me give me just a second. I'm going to grab these and there we go. So let me get the uh, American Astronomical Society link first and I'm going to put that in the chat. So there you go. There's that one. Then let me get the maps. And so here's the first link for the map for the eclipse on October 14th. Then we've got the link for the map for April 8th. So there you go. You've got the links, click on those and um, you'll have them. So bookmark them, save them. And hopefully you'll get to see one or both of these eclipses. And I'm seeing I'm seeing some uh, information in the chat. Carol's going to Arkansas. Yep, Carol, I remember you're going to Arkansas. Um, Carol is my celebratory champagne eclipse person. So it is always fun to toast an eclipse. So bring your favorite beverage. It does not have to be champagne. It could be sparkling grape juice. Um, so whatever you like, just bring it to celebrate because that is something worthy of celebration. Uh, no matter where you are, even if you get to see a partial eclipse, that's still fun. They do not happen every day. We get two to five solar eclipses a year on the planet. Not everybody gets to see them. It could be years before you see a solar eclipse. So seeing anything at all is worthy of a little celebration, either a beverage, maybe your favorite food. So hopefully when I see you uh, later in, in May next year, maybe I'll get to hear about some of your eclipse adventures. That'd be pretty fun. Sid stayed uh, Sid stayed halfway in between uh, where he is and the path of totality. That's also a really smart thing to do. Just cut down the um, the amount of driving that you do just prior to the eclipse and just after the eclipse. The other thing, if you're thinking about driving to Southern Illinois or driving to totality in Indiana somewhere, number one, bring a paper map with you of wherever you're going. I think Carol... Uh, told me, Carol, was it last week or the week before that, um, at least I think it was you, Carol, that uh, wrote to the Arkansas folks and wanted to get a paper map and got six of them. <laughs> so they, they want to give you maps. So get the latest road map and then get off the interstate. The reason for that is uh, everybody will be on the interstate. And so you want to get out of the traffic jam if you possibly can. And if you're thinking you can then go on to Google Maps and find your way around, it's you're going to have so many people doing the same thing. It's going to crash the cell phone towers just like they did in 2017. People got stuck in these traffic jams and they couldn't get a map up on their phones to get them from to someplace else. But if you take the back roads, as long as you know where you're going and as long as like there's gas stations along the way, mar map, mark out your map, on, on, mark out your route on your map and get yourself a back way of getting home because you'll get home a lot faster than people who are trying to take the interstates. Um, just stock up with some water and some other stuff, some snacks, always a good thing to do. So take a paper map, all right? And um, yeah, so uh, Sid says, if you have State Farm, the agents have free Rand McNally atlases. Yes, check with uh, your insurance agent. They may have access to some, some of these uh, paper maps and atlases. Um, it's hard to believe in these days you go, but what do I need that for? Well, you may not be able to get on your, you may not get a cell phone signal to get your map. Another possibility, though, is to download offline maps onto your phone. You can do that with Google Maps and other map apps. Get a map uh, or 
do a download, an offline download of a map, that, or sorry, a download ahead of time of a map, maybe a week or so out, so that you can use the offline map version. Means the map is there, it won't show you the traffic update, it'll show your GPS location, but you'll at least be able to get from place to place using the offline map. So that's another possibility. Um, so it's, uh, oh, I love paper maps too, Iga. Oh, I'm with you. I love looking at them. So they're just fun to have. Um, and then you can go investigate wonderful parts of our state that you might have missed if you just stayed on the interstate. Um, so the, the paper map, the offline map on your phone, take some water with you, take the back routes, and and then you'll, you should be pretty golden. So um, any questions from folks? I'm going to go back and make sure I didn't miss uh, any questions? While you're doing that, please go ahead. I have an announcement to make. I completely forgot to do this at the beginning, so I hope y'all are still with me. If you have a Bloomingdale Public Library card starting on October 2nd, you can come in the library and get a pair of glasses to view the eclipse. Because Michelle told me about this over a year ago that there was a grant out there for libraries to get a free glasses. So I filled out the paperwork and we got our free glasses. Um, we don't have a huge amount of them, but if you have a Bloomingdale library card starting October 2nd, come to either the adult reference desk or the children's reference desk and show your card and we'll give you an Eclipse glasses. Um, Karen asked, what is the best time for maximum viewing of the April eclipse? Um, so that depends on where you are. Uh, so the maximum time for April for our area is just after 2 p.m. So that's the maximum 94% time. That that exact time will depend on where you are. But just, a, just after 2 p.m. Central time for our area. If you're farther outside of our area, it will depend on where you are. So definitely go to the April 8th map and you can get your exact timing actually to the second if you want it for wherever you are. So you can get it exactly for Bloomingdale um, or, or whatever, whichever suburb you're in. So grab that map or gra you know, grab that eclipse map from the time and date website and put in your exact location or or a town very close to it. And that'll show you your exact timing for that eclipse, actually for both of them. So just after 2 p.m. in general for our area, but look it up for, for your exact location. And actually uh, the Adler sent out 125 solar viewing glasses of these to every public library in Illinois. So you should have another 125 of them uh, that just arrived, I think about two weeks ago <laughs> or a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so. my boss said she was like, okay, we have the glasses from the grant. We have a few from the Adler. And she said she also purchased some, but now I'm gonna have to say, did you get it on A-M-A-Z-O-N or? <laughs> <laughs> or not. I'm not sure. So we'll have to double check with her and make sure. Yep. And Carol said, remember the box over your head viewer. Yeah, we taught it. We talked about that. So the, that's another form of a pinhole projector where people can, if you put um, a pinhole in a box, and as long as the pinhole is off to the side of your head, you can put the pinhole in the box right here. And then the pinhole faces the sun. So put the sun behind you and the pinhole faces the sun, and then the back of the inside of the box becomes your screen. And as long as you position the box just right, you can get a little tiny image of the eclipse ahead of you. Um, that's kind of nice because the inside of the box is a little bit darker. The problem becomes facing you in the right direction and getting that pinhole just positioned correctly, it's harder to do which is why the index card little pinhole version is so much easier because you'll know immediately if you've got it in the right spot or not. But the, the box version is just fine. Just make sure you've got the sun to your back and make sure the pinhole is off to one side of your head. You don't want your head blocking the pinhole <laughs> or else you're projecting an image on the back of your head. <laughs> Any other questions before we end for tonight? And and uh, Christina, if uh, if you're not sure uh, about the about those glasses that were purchased, let me know. <laughs> I may be okay. able to help investigate. So yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it, I mean, we remember from 2017, there was a big run on glasses. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a bunch, but people came in and took them all. Um, and then they were very like, you know, like worried right at the end that people who didn't get glasses were like scrambling. So we were very aware at that time that there were counterfeit glasses and we were trying to tell people to be careful. But like you say, you know, going on Amazon is so easy. And if they can counterfeit the manufacturer's information, their name on all of that stuff, then it's kind of hard to tell. And you really have to go to their own website, not buy it from a third party. Yep. Yep. And some of these manufacturers do have web stores on Amazon. So if you are on the Rainbow Symphony store on Amazon, you're okay. Just be careful and make sure that it is their store. Um, so you, by now, you, if you've used Amazon, you know what to look for. You look for the 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 name on the name of the store on the upper left hand part of the screen. So just look for that. Just be really careful, and don't just look up Rainbow Symphony or American Paper Optics or whatever on Amazon. The other thing that um, uh, we definitely started seeing uh, about a year ago was people saying, "Oh, well, uh, NASA NASA selling glasses, or we're selling NASA glasses." Hmm. Those glasses are either free because NASA doesn't sell anything or they're counterfeit because anyone can grab NASA's logo off the Internet and 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 stick it on something. Um, they shouldn't, but they can. So just be really careful where you get them from and you'll be OK. And when in doubt, don't use glasses. Don't look directly at it. Use a pinhole projection method to look indirectly at an image and you're fine. Don't get so freaked out that you miss the eclipse. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder too if there are any like live streamers, like yes. YouTubers, who are going to be out uh, taking video, so you could just yes. watch them on TV. Absolutely, we're going to do it for the October eclipse. Um, the Adler's YouTube channel. If it's clear out, we're going to have a, a live program on YouTube starting at ten fifteen. And the eclipse for us starts at 1037. So that's when we're going to start seeing the, the moon start to peek across the sun. Um, and then we will uh, broadcast that with us on screen, my staff member Hunter and I, until 11. We'll go off screen. Hunter's going to stay with the video feed and keep the telescope pointed at the sun to see the rest of the eclipse, provided it's clear out. If it's not clear out, we're not going to show you a cloudy sky, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to be on from 1015 to 11 answering people's questions. So um, YouTube.com slash Adler Planetarium. Um, and we're also going to have telescopes out at the Adler, free stuff going on outside uh, the Adler that day. So if you want to come down and join us on October 14th, it's a Saturday. Um, it'd be a lot of fun to, to see folks in person because it's considering I mostly see you online. So I it'd be, know, I was it'd be fun. Say, hey, it's a Saturday. That'd be yeah. a good opportunity to go it's, down. Yep. Yep. I'll All be right. there running around. So. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I just want to again, remind people to come in, get a pair of glasses. If you have a Bloomingdale public library card starting October 2nd, and then we're going to have Michelle back with us on October 23rd on zoom. 12 Things That Make Life on Earth Possible. She's going to be back in January for a talk on constellations and in May for a talk on Artemis. So please join us again for that. And thank you again so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you soon. Okay. Have a good night. Bye-bye.